Thank you so much for joining us on The Dwelling Show. I'm your host, Ola Dantes. I've got Matt Drew with us today. Did I get that right? Yes, Drew in. Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> hey, Matt, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing awesome. Thanks for having me on. No, my absolute pleasure. Um, you know, really excited to have you on today. Um, let's just jump right into it. So, you know, kind of just tell our guests a little bit more about who you are and kind of, you know, what you've been up to and what you've been doing lately, actually. Who I am, I'm still trying to figure that out, I think. Uh, but uh, what I have been up to is I've been uh, started in multi multifamily, small multifamily as an owner occupant back in 2006 uh, with the idea that uh, of being coming financially independent by this time I was 40 years old. Um, and I was able to achieve that back when I was 33. Uh, so, and, you know, and it took a long, it took a long time in terms of doing a lot of smaller deals. And then I started getting into commercial, uh, commercial investment and focusing on there and just found that all that work that I did over that, you know, 11 year period was like, I could have done it in one deal in one year. So I just started focusing on acquiring and developing commercial assets. Um, you know, one, you know, one property a year that uh, that has two hundred thousand dollars a year or more in gross rents, and then I could just focus on you know doing one good deal a year, and then you know and recycling the capital over and over again. So you said you were financially free at thirty three. Correct. Mm -hmm. How did you do that? Let's start there. <laughs> I mean, uh, tactically. Ta tactically, it was uh, utilizing the the Burr method. Um, I didn't know it was. It wasn't even called that at that point in time because I I believe the Bigger Pockets podcast wasn't even a thing at that point. But um, but yeah, I would uh, buy property, buy properties, fix them up, then um, you know lease them up, refinance them, and then you know take that you know take that cash out capital and keep reinvesting it. And also, I was. Uh, deliberately not taking any distributions out of the real estate investments. So take those cash flows and reinvest them back into the properties and push rents and buy more properties and, uh, um, you know, refinance those. So that's how I was really able to grow exponentially over that time period by rolling that, that snowball, so to speak. Um, a lot of people that get involved with real estate investing, they're like, oh, I want to have some extra money. I want to have like $200 a month or $300 a month extra to afford a car payment or something like that. Um, I was like, you know, keeping that cash sacred and just living off of my, you know, income as a, as a real estate professional, um, as a real estate broker or a property manager or various other roles I've had in my career. Wow. Fascinating. So how many of those did you do to get to financial freedom? Cause that'd be quite insightful for our audience. Okay, so uh, I mean, it's important to rewind back to the first deal I ever did. It was a four, it was a four family that I purchased basically by accident because my dad was kicking me out of the house, um, and I had never paid rent up until that point in time. And the idea of paying rent was I was I liked to hold on to my uh, to my pennies and nickels and stuff like that. So, um, and I was a real estate agent at the time. So he's like, you know, you would be a lot more credible as an agent if you've gone through the process yourself of purchasing a property. So I found a four family and I bought that one. It was, uh, did it with a, uh, what was called subprime mortgage, uh, subprime mortgage. I think a lot of people don't, don't remember what that was, but, uh, it really, really allowed me to put 10% down on the property. I got uh, $5,000 back in seller's concessions. So I was able to buy this four family for $16,000 which is like every penny I had, every penny I put into this property. And it was scary. But uh, when I first got those rent checks, like two weeks after I closed, I was like, I knew how hard it was to earn $1,800 as a real estate agent and commission income. And it was like that $1,800 came so, so easily. So I knew I was onto something in terms of learning about passive-ish income. So you bought this duplex and you were like, oh my goodness, this is, this, this is good. Like this, this, you know, makes sense. Right. Um, and then that kind of, kind of, you know, got, got your, your start, I guess, in multifamily. So what did you do next after that? I'm kind of curious on your second deal. So the second deal. So the first, the first deal was a quadplex. So I had lived in one of the units, rented out the other three. Um, and also I had a roommate, so I was making 200 bucks a month in, uh, in cash flow while living there and paying all the expenses. There was a property down the street from there that my dad was like, 
it was this property was the worst property in the street and it was in a good neighborhood too so my dad kept bugging me every time he came over for like pizza and beer he's like hey have you taught have you called the seller on that property it looks like you know they probably have code violations and this that and the other thing and i finally started getting serious about contacting the seller just to shut my old man up right so i just didn't want to hear him asking me about it uh over and over again so um the property was not financeable uh so so I was able to utilize a bridge loan or a hard money loan at the time through a relationship with a mortgage, a mortgage company that we referred a lot of business to as Realtors. And they uh, lended me 100% of the purchase price, 100% of the rehab. And I you know, got to work on that property, hiring contractors, getting taken advantage of severely um, as a 22-year-old um, young person. And so I was able to fix up that property, lease it up, and then I was able to refinance it and, and pay that bridge lender back. And I had no money into the deal. So I was like, if, if, I can take, if I can have money not be a bottleneck for my growth, then the possibilities are endless. So that's kind of how I went from you know, buying the next property and buying the next property. I used the same method every time fascinating fascinating yeah i really like that story if there's somebody listening now and they want to just do that same exact thing which is like buying a fourplex and obviously living in one of the units and then renting the others out to you know tenants or wherever what do you think is the first step for that person to do today the first step is that they're going to have to look at their own finances uh, to understand that can they afford to purchase a, purchase the property if you're buying your first property, you have no experience, um, you're probably going to be, you're going to have to lean on a lender, a conventional lender to, um, to get a loan on that property. So the first thing is like, okay, can I, can I afford to put money down? And if you, if you are a, uh, if you're like a, uh, a responsible adult and you don't have the money to purchase your first property, you have to start asking yourself the question, why do I have no money? And figure that question out first. And the answer to that, it could be lack of income. It could be a uh, lack of income. If that's the case, find a profession or a, or a career or a position where you can use your talents to get paid for your performance. Um, if it's most of the times it's expenses. You know, I tell a lot of people, look at your last three months of bank statements, highlight every single purchase that was, that was, you know, not necessary, right? Going out to eat, um, buying, you know, buying expensive beer, which is one of my problems, um, and just stuff like that. And you'll find that you can save, you know, you can save up to almost a thousand dollars a month just by trimming out unnecessary expenses. Uh, so that's really where I'd get started. It's kind of the boring first place to start is looking at your own finances. But I think it's the, it's the first thing to get very, very clear and very, very few people that I talk to that are first starting out, have their own personal finance, finances, financial house in order. So somebody might say, wow, that, you know, you, you got financial free at 33, you must have a lot of properties. Um, you know, do you have to deal with tenants, toilets, you know, and all this, all these things, you know, and people think, well, I don't, I don't know if I'm ready to do that. I mean, what would you say to that person now that you've got this, you know, this portfolio of properties that you have to manage? Um, and that obviously comes with tenants and, and all the issues that you have to deal with. Um, how are you managing that? And what does the structure of your, of your business look like today? So I had a very cobbled together management structure before I partnered up with somebody to create a management company to put, you know, to put my assets under management with them. Uh, so I was doing a lot of the work myself. I was leasing all of the apartments. I was, you know, coordinating with contractors and handymen and all that stuff. And it was taking up a lot of my, a lot of my time. This whole thing of passive income seemed like a bunch of baloney because it definitely was not passive. Um, so I was, uh, so last year, no, two years ago, actually, I made the goal. I was like, I need to fire myself from the management of the business. So, uh, but the thing is that I didn't want to give it up to a third party management company and, and, and lose that control. I knew that the attention to detail with tenant retention, tenant retention is where you make money. If you have constant turnover, then you're losing, you're losing money. And I know that you're in, uh, Ola, you're involved with multifamily. If you have low retention is are, are when you have bad years. And I don't think a lot of property management companies are orientated towards that, especially with like the smaller 
properties that that I I own. I just started buying larger properties a few years ago, but the smaller properties it's very difficult to find a property management company, and especially the the good ones are not necessarily set up or orientated or um, oriented or uh, or motivated to drive high tenant retention through you know delighting your tenants, do, going out of going out of your way, making it so that, for example, in Rochester, New York real estate is very, very inexpensive compared to other parts of the country. So if you can make it as easy as you can for your tenants, then they may put off the decision to buy a house for another year and another year, right? If they don't have to think about plowing or, you know, or maintenance or anything like that. Um, and that's really what we do. And that's the number one reason why we lose tenants is due to uh, home purchases. So I really loved your story on Bigger Pockets, right? Uh, you, you you talked about that that particular deal. So you know, as we're kind of you know getting close to wrapping up, I just wanted you to talk about that deal again. Just give us the backstory, you know, maybe the numbers, and we can kind of dig into that a little bit. Just a, qu- a quick case study for us. Okay, yeah. So this was the first larger commercial property. It was brought to me by a broker, a commercial broker I had a relationship with. Um, rule uh, key number one out of the story takeaway is. Uh, and when you're going into commercial, commercial brokers are your gold. They are gold. Um, so they brought me this deal. They said, hey, you're the first person I thought of when you know coming to this. I know you own a lot of property around the area. Um, here's the address. Take a look around it. Do a drive by. Walk through the you know common area lobby and check it out. Let me know if you're interested. It's By the way, it's a million dollars. So I as soon as I like looked it up on Google Maps and saw this property, I was like, oh, I have to go see it. So I jumped in my car, went over there. I looked at the preliminary numbers he sent over to me and I was like, all right, I got to buy this property. And I told him, you know, listen, we are going to do a deal this weekend on this property. All right. Do not bring it on to market. I want it. So, um, so I was very, very aggressive about taking it down. And I, you know, it required between 200 and $300,000, which I did not have. Um, I got it under contract anyways. And I was like, all right, I'm going to figure out how to figure this out. If the deal is good, good enough as I think it is and how I underwrit it, uh, underwritten it conservatively, I'll be able to find the money. So I went back to the investors that had lent me money before for mortgages, and they partnered with me to um, to purchase the purchase the property. And what I did is, in exchange for them providing the money, I get, they were just fine with getting fixed percentage of interest uh, on the property. They didn't want any equity or anything like that. Uh, they didn't want to have to deal with like K ones and all that stuff. Um, so we closed on the property and I had, you know, I was able to identify a lot of waste in terms of expenses. And then also because the property had, you know, it was an office building. Okay. And because the offices were, it was hundred percent occupied for the past like 15 years. So what that signaled to me was that rents were under market. So I went, I viewed it rental comps and, you know, each office suite was about, you know, 20% down uh, below uh, below market rents. So I knew that I could push those out as leases expired. And so that's what I did. And I increased the income, decreased the expenses, was able to make the property more valuable. And I was able to, you know, bring it back to my bank, refin- refinance it and pay the $300,000 um, back to my investors that uh, partnered with me on the deal. Wow. And how long did that take from kind of the start to, to finish? Just roughly. So it was a five-year business plan. It took, it took me three years. I knew it was going to take me less than five years, but I wanted to give myself enough runway so that, you know, when I, when I partner with anybody, I always want to, you know, uh, under promise and over deliver and be very, very super conservative. So that's what I did with this, uh, with this deal. So I just wanted to capitalize on the low interest rate environment as well. Um, so, uh, that's, uh, how long it took. Awesome. 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 Yeah, no, I really appreciate that you, you shared that with us as much as I want to keep going on and, and talking with you. <laughs> uh, we definitely, definitely do adding into the quick rounds. Yeah, these are going to be quick questions and quick answers. You ready, sir? Yes, I am. All right. First question. Um, what makes you Matt unique? What is that differentiating factor that separates you from the next guy or the next girl? I have an insatiable curiosity and also I am extremely obsessive. So I, I like am obsessed about a couple different things. One of them is, is real estate. And uh, like uh, one of, you know, one of my idols, Grant Cardone says is you have to, you know, be obsessed or be average. So a lot of things, you know, obsession is seen as a bad thing. I see it as a good thing. It's, it's what you can use as rocket fuel to uh, propel you towards your dreams and aspirations. Awesome. 
what was the last book that you read and what was the one thing you picked out from that book? So the last book that I read was um, Am I Being Too Subtle by Sam Zell. Uh, and that was a book that um, I took out of it was managing, uh, managing downside risk. Uh, I really, really took that, uh, took, took that out of the book um, as one of the you know, great things as to how to look at risk and how to structure your deals in a way where you're m- minimizing downside risk mm-hmm. and uh, maximizing your upside potential. Because the last thing you want to do is, is, is ever lose money. Awesome. Yeah, we definitely don't want that. So you've got obviously your, your, your project, you're a busy man, you've got things going on. What do you do for fun? Oh, she's, I, I love to cook. Um, that's one thing I love to do, uh, home, uh, home bartending. So when I have family over I make cocktails, uh, so I'm very, I'm a very popular man around the house. Um, I and I really, for myself, um, you know, I like to, I love to lift weights. That's kind of like where I get my alone, my alone time where I can kind of go to my, you know, to, to my own headspace. Uh, and it's very, very meditative for me. And it's something that I'm very passionate about. Awesome. I've got like a bonus question, actually. Now that you're financially, now that you're financially free, I mean, do you just like sit around on the beach all day, like just you know sipping margaritas and you know what does that look like, right? Uh, re- reaching financial freedom was one of the most uh, depressing moments I ever had in my life. Um, so wow, wow. Yeah, because it was something. Remember, it's something I set out for myself when I turned 20, 21. and the reason for the obsession and that goal was due to just uh, child, childhood trauma um, with things that happened in my family and all of them I learned being traced back to lack of money. So when I was able to achieve financial independence, um, I was like, what do I do now? I'm like, you know, I, I, you know, sitting on the beach and sipping Mai Tais and stuff like that was not for me. So I had to uh, go through the painful re- process of reinventing myself. Um, so I ended up, you know, reading the 10 X rule by Grant Cardone. And I was like, I need to make the next milestone basically ridiculous and unachievable. So I never have to go through that process again. Cause I'd rather die not reaching a goal than reaching a goal and having to reinvent myself. Um, so, so yeah, so the next, you know, next goal is, uh, to acquire a million square feet under ownership of the management. I want to build a um, net worth of $20 million and like to turn that into a private family office fund to, uh, to reinvest a million dollars a year into our local community of Rochester, New York, um, funding real estate deals, private mortgages, startup capital for, uh, for mom and pop uh, street level businesses and uh, technology companies and stuff like that. So I have a, a long lasting impact uh, long after my time on earth. So that's the next thing. Oh man, what a noble cause. I, I love that. I love that. And if there's somebody listening, thinking, oh, wow, I like this, this, you know, Matthew guy, I want to get connected with Matthew. Where's the best place people can reach out and get to know you more? Uh, I'm pretty, I'm active on all social media platforms, but I think uh, LinkedIn is a great, uh, is a great avenue to uh, search for me. So yeah, if you just look up um, Matthew, that's with two T's and Druin, D-R-O-U-I-N, you can find me there. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and now you can find me on TikTok as well. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm very, I'm very, very available. I'm an open book and I like, I'd like to help anybody along their, uh, their journey to, uh, to uh, fulfilling their dreams as well. Matt, Matt, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really learned a ton myself. Really appreciate you taking time to come and join us here on the Dwelling Show today. Thank you so much. Yes. Thanks, Ola. Have a good one now.